All right, so I think we'll go ahead with the introductions. Um, for our environmental health breakout session today, uh, we have Dr. Samples and Dr. Kalu that are going to do a presentation for us on the prevalence of zoonotic diseases in white-tailed deer and potential for infection of hunters, taxidermists, and game processors. We are very happy to have both of these guests presenting for us today. Dr. Samples is a 1994 graduate of Fort Valley State University holding both a BS and AAS in veterinary technology, a master's degree in the field of public health, and a doctorate in health sciences from Nova Southeastern University. As an associate professor, she currently serves as program coordinator for the MPH program at Fort Valley State University, where she has worked in a variety of roles for the past 26 years, including adjunct professor, or, I'm sorry, adjunct instructor, teaching biology, biology labs, and lead veterinary technologist where she taught veterinary clinical pathology, veterinary parasitology, and microbiology. Uh, Dr. Samples is also a writer uh, with various publications, including several book chapters and articles related to veterinary clinical pathology, parasitology, and public health in both scientific and freelance publications as well as serving as co-editor for the ninth and 10th edition of McKernan's textbook for veterinary patients. She is also published in the genre of public health, both locally and at the state level. She serves on a variety of uh, or committees for veterinary um, science. She is currently anticipating publication of her first lab manual of clinical pathology for veterinary technicians in 2021. Dr. Semple's research interests resolve, revolve predominantly around veterinary public health topics such as parasitology, zoonotic diseases, and public health issues which surround veterinary medicine and the One Health model. So we are very glad to have Dr. Samples, who is going to do the first part of the presentation, uh, followed by Dr. Kalu. Uh, Dr. Kalu is originally from Nigeria, where he stud studied medicine and surgery at the University of Jos Teaching Hospital in Nigeria, where he graduated in 2010. He served a surgical internship residency at Abu Bakar. And um, I'm apologizing right now, uh, Dr. Kalu, for, it, for any mispronunciations. Um, but he now has his own uh, medical surgical practice. Um, he completed his MPH degree with a concentration in environmental health in 2018 at Fort Valley State University. Um, he was subsequent, subsequently employed by the Department of Veterinary Science and Public Health, where he continues to assist with veterinary anatomy labs and microbiology. He's also engaged in veterinary medical research of zoonotic diseases in North American wildlife species, along with Dr along Dr. Samples. Um, he currently resides in Fort Valley and is studying for his US medical competency exams. And as I understand, is also currently pursuing a doctorate in public health at Georgia Southern. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and we will we'll now turn it over to both of these presenters um, for our presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Grice. Uh, we appreciate being here and we're so thankful to see our GPHA conference coming back in a virtual way. Uh, it was really missed last year. Conferences are missed all the way around. I think everybody can agree on that. And so even in a virtual world, we're just happy to be able to have this fellowship with you and to uh, present some of the work that we have been engaged in over the last year or so, or about the last two years, actually. And so the title of our topic, Prevalence of Zoonotic Diseases in White-Tailed Deer and the Potential for Infection of Hunters, Taxidermists, and Game Processors, this is actually a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I grew up in a family of coon hunters, and also some deer hunters, but mostly coon hunters. Um, and I've also, I've always, ever since I've been in public health, thought that we really do not pay enough attention to this particular population of uh, wild game hunters in the United States. And they are 
you know, sort of an outlying population. A lot of people don't think about them, but um, they are actually really at the forefront when it comes to the potential for some different diseases and disease processes um, as they go about their hobbies of hunting wildlife. Next slide, please. So to start with, this particular project is actually part of a five-year Evans Allen grant that was funded by NIFA and the USDA. And we initially wanted to look at ways that livestock, or excuse me, wild animals, especially our wild ruminants, our deer, uh, elk, et cetera, in this country can potentially infect beef cattle. And that was to lead to an agricultural slant for this project uh, regarding the fact that if beef cattle are being impacted by infectious diseases and parasites, they may also be passing this on to, say, farmers and those that handle livestock. Currently in the state of Georgia, there are beef cattle in residence in all 159 counties of Georgia, according to the Georgia Beef Cattle Association. Now, I'm not sure where they're hiding out in Fulton County, but according to the beef people, there is a cow in every county of Georgia. Beef cattle contribute approximately $132.8 billion to our country's gross domestic products. We have a very heavy dependency upon beef, both economically, nutritionally, and financially. Beef cattle provide food, obviously. They also do help with soil fertility. They diversify our agricultural products in this country, and they actually are responsible for a large sector of employment in this country. There are approximately 25,463 livestock farms in Georgia. And so even if you look at some of these as being the backyard farmer, where maybe it's just a farmer and maybe one or two helpers, and then you go all the way up to people that are, that are actually farming large herds and have maybe a staff of 10, 20, 25 people, they are, you can see where they are economically important as far as providing jobs. Next slide, please. So our central focus for this particular uh, five-year product project is actually wildlife. And we are specifically interested in the white-tailed deer for two reasons. One, it is a ruminant, and ruminants tend to hang out in environments frequented by other ruminants. So they have similar grazing needs, they have similar habitat needs. And unfortunately for our farmed livestock, or, and mainly I, when I speak of farmed livestock, I'm speaking of beef cattle, uh, there is a good potential for transmission of disease to beef cattle due to shared environments with white-tailed deer. This transmission could also potentially include zoonotic diseases that may be passed on deer to cattle to human. Now, the first question everybody's going to ask or should be thinking of is, well, what's the correlation? How are white-tailed deer and beef cattle ending up in these, <clears throat> excuse me, same environment, it's very simple. White-tailed deer are not dummies. They are very smart, they are very cunning, and they are very good at surviving despite the number of them you may see on the roads and the highways of our state. White-tailed deer figured out many, many years ago that in order to escape predation by you know, things like coyotes, if they blended in with a cattle herd, they were less likely to experience predation by predators looking to make a meal off of them. 
they also are less likely to be targeted by hunters because obviously we're not going to go hunting and shooting into a herd full of cattle. Uh, also, white-tailed deer are very easily accepted into cattle herds in terms of it's not like they're accepted and we've become one big happy family, but the cattle are most often in large enough areas that they are not mindful of the deer being there. They don't mind them you know, grazing on the same areas. Both species basically coexist quite not quite nicely together. And so they it, you may never have noticed it, but as you're driving around the state of Georgia, if you see a herd of beef cattle out in the field, sort of scan the herd because every once in a while I will see a white-tailed deer just chopper block right in the middle of a field full of cows grazing away and nobody's paying attention to anybody. So there is that potential for danger of disease transmission to our farmed livestock. Our central focus for this particular project was to try to identify what potential zoonotic diseases were presently current, were currently present in the white-tailed deer populations in Georgia. And also, was there a correlation between diseases that we see in white-tailed deer and diseases that we see in beef cattle in counties where the shared environments were most likely to occur. And, and by this, I would define uh, those counties as counties that had large populations of beef cattle and had a, a significant uh, presence within the county. Next slide. So as far as mode of transmission for such diseases between deer and cattle, the most common is your gastrointestinal parasite. And many of the gastrointestinal parasites, or GINs as we like to call them, that we see in white-tailed deer are also common in beef cattle, dairy cattle, sheep, and goats. And so by the fact that these parasites are generally easily, uh, they easily set up housekeeping, so to speak, in all of these different ruminant species, it's very easy for them to be transmitted onto the pasture because, of course, gastrointestinal parasites rely on the circle of life, so to speak, which starts with an animal grazing the pasture where the larvae have crawled up to the ends of the grass in the mornings, most likely, to seek moisture from dew. And so the animals are coming along and they're cropping the grass, they're eating, and they ingest these parasites, the parasitic larvae, which goes into the gastrointestinal tract. It goes through a series of stages of maturation until you have reproductive parasites that now begin to reproduce and lay eggs. And once the eggs are in the GI system, they're again passed back through the fecal matter, back onto the pasture, where they themselves, the eggs will hatch, larvae crawls up to the ends of the grass, something nibbles on the grass, and we start the cycle all over again. And so it's a very, although it seems like a very complex cycle, it's actually a very simple cycle, and it's a cycle that enables parasites to reproduce and to almost guarantee their uh, sufficiency or self-sufficiency in being able to complete their life cycle again and again. It also leads to the fact that many of the fields where animals that are infested with these different parasites and they're defecating on the pasture and then eating the grass, the fields themselves or the grazing areas can become quite contaminated and so for this reason alone, many farmers will have their beef cattle, dairy cattle, or if they're doing small ruminants with the sheep and goats, they will have them on a regular scheduled maintenance of deworming to try to keep these parasites down. Not necessarily, you may not necessarily be able to completely eradicate them, but you can at least keep them down to a manageable level where the animal does not suffer from such things as anemia or other uh, parasitic related processes that may cause some economic 
disasters in terms of unthrifty animals, uh, lack of milk production, reproductive disorders, things like that. We also are concerned with anaplasmosis, which is a tick-borne disease, and it is most commonly carried by the black-legged tick. This particular tick is seen in ruminants, deer, cattle, sheep, goats, etc. It's also known to infect humans with anaplasmosis. And so anaplasmosis is a disease that actually it's a very, very microscopic parasite that attaches itself to the red blood cells. And Dr. Kalu will be speaking about that with some really cool pictures in just a moment. But suffice to say, anaplasmosis in white-tailed deer is not it's not transmitted to the hunter through handling the blood or, or the meat or the carcass. But what happens is it can be transmitted if you have that particular tick carrying that particular disease on the deer carcass, and it is somehow transferred to the human, bites the human, and now we have a potential for anaplasmosis, which is a zoonotic disease in humans. Some other diseases of white-tailed deer that we are currently thinking about and, and looking at as sort of a side uh, show to this whole grant is bovine viral diarrhea, avian influenza, brucellosis, leptospirosis, and also as of about two weeks ago, we will also be testing for uh, some diseases that you don't normally think about in deer, such as anthrax and quite possibly COVID-19. Diseases of white-tailed deer that we are specifically interested in as far as zoonotic diseases are, of course, the parasite-borne diseases, salmonella, and anaplasmosis. Next slide, please. So our research objective is basically to identify gastrointestinal nematodes and parasites in white-tailed deer carcasses. And this was done during the DNR-sponsored quota hunts during the Georgia 2021 hunting season for the purpose of this presentation. We also wanted to identify bloodborne pathogens, specifically anaplasmosis, in the same uh, sample of convenience, which of course was whatever deer were presented, deer carcasses were presented at the quota hunts for the Department of Natural Resources at specific hunts that we attended. We also wanted to assess, because of course we're all about public health, we want to assess the knowledge of hunters and wild game processors regarding the spread of zoonotic diseases and whether or not they're even aware of such a thing. Next slide, please. So our methodology was to design a study that was quantitative in nature. Uh, as I mentioned, basically our samples were a sample of convenience. Uh, the blood, feces, and occasional tissue samples were collected from deer carcasses at specific DNR sanctioned quota hunts in the state of Georgia during the 2021 hunting season. We collected fecal matter directly from the intestinal tracts to look for gastrointestinal nematodes. We collected blood samples to screen for anaplasmosis. And also because your game processors, they are the ones that can tell you just by feel and sight when they're field dressing an animal out to get ready to process the meat, they can tell by the feel of the organs if something's not right. And they've just done this so many times and they were a wonderful asset to us because they would be just processing and all of a sudden they'd say, can you come here and look at this? This doesn't feel right or this doesn't look right. And if we saw something that was, as they said, didn't look right, didn't feel right, we took a sample and sent the samples off to the Tipton Diagnostic Labs, which is affiliated with the UGA School of Veterinary Medicine, just to see exactly what was going on with these different animals. And we actually saw some pretty interesting things as, as we moved through this uh, study. Next slide, please. So for the gastrointestinal nematodes, fecal material was collected from the rectum or from uh, 
the intestinal tract. And it was stored in Ziploc bags for chilled transport to a parasitology lab at the Stallworth Agricultural Station at the Department of, uh, excuse me, at Fort Valley State University. And that was one of our partners, Dr. Tom Terrell, he actually was in charge of conducting all of our fecal examinations. Uh, the anal analysis was done via the McMaster's technique, a very common technique that is used to determine the number of parasitic eggs per gram. Now, this does not necessarily, it will tell you what type of parasite it is, such as around worms, hookworms, uh, trematodes, flatworms, et cetera. It will also give you a good idea of the worm burden for that animal. So if it's heavily parasitized or if it's just a very mild infestation. We also collected blood from both the body cavity as well as cardiac punctures when we were able to access the heart prior to field dressing. And in, in both cases, however the blood was collected, it was stored in both a red top and a purple top tube so that we were able to actually do both blood smears to look for anaplasmosis. And we also were able to run a 12 panel chemistry analysis on the blood, just again, to kind of try to get a baseline of what the overall health status was for the deer. Next slide, please. Preliminary results for 2021 showed that the majority of the deer did have anaplasmosis in just about every county that we looked at. Now, again, with this sample of convenience, and at that time, it was only myself and Dr. Kalu and one graduate student that was part-time uh, actually doing the collection. And so Dr. Kalu and I collected uh, Fridays and Saturdays for every weekend in October and one weekend in no November. So we had a total of five collection weekends with two days each. So let's just say 10 collection days. And we were at that time limited. We went, our farthest county out was Burke County, which is on the Eastern coastal area down from Augusta. All of the other counties were located here in middle Georgia. We did, uh, and I, I may miss some and I apologize if I do, but we did Talbot County, Crawford County, we had some out of Bibb County, uh, and, and with these counties, what you have to understand is, for instance, Talbot County has a very, very popular processing plant, and it's called Fuller's Processing, and Fuller's has the name in middle Georgia. And so we would oftentimes see deer that were actually killed in counties that were 50, 60 miles away and they came to Fuller's to have their meat processed. And so that was kind of nice because we did get a little bit of a more diversified sample from different counties. Burke County had the highest number of homonchus contortus, which is a gastrointestinal parasite that is uh, pretty detrimental in terms of with a heavy infestation, you get anemia, you have problems with reproductibility of animals, and they're just become generally unthrifty. Uh, your meat product may not be all that great. Certainly milk production goes down, things of that nature. We also noticed, and this was something that we were very interested to see, and that is in Crawford, Bibb, and Jefferson County, the deer exhibited a sickle-shaped red blood cell, which actually is a normal blood shape for white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer, may, when you look at a blood sample, you may see the, the traditional round red blood cell, but you may also see some that are sickle-shaped and look almost identical to what we see in sickle cell anemia in humans but it is not an adverse or negative finding in deer. It's actually quite normal. Next slide, please. And so with the sickling in the red blood cell of the deer, it does have 
the gross morphology, basically the same shape. And, and it is reversible by use of oxygen supplied modulation or pH. However, again, it is not an abnormal finding for them. The mean blood pH for deer blood is 7.4. And also the sickling in deer erythrocytes does not undergo a membrane fragility and it does not cause harm to the deer as we see the harm in humans. So again, it is a normal finding. Next slide, please. Now, what was interesting to us was that the data that we analyzed showed that sickled red blood cells were present in all of the white-tailed deer that were infected with anaplasmosis, homonchus contortus, and also a gram-positive bacilli, which was seen most prevalently in Burke County. The gram-positive bacilli has not been identified because at that point we were unable to actually send the blood in for confirmatory testing. And of course, you cannot do confirmatory testing based on a picture of a blood smear. However, it did add a dimension to the study for this year, for the 21-22 hunting season, that all blood that is identified with this particular uh, gram-positive bacteria will be sent for confirmatory testing to the Tifton Diagnostic Lab to confirm the bacteria ID. One of the reasons that we want to do this is because there are several different diseases that present with bacteria that is the shape of a rod. Uh, the, of course, the most dangerous would be anthrax, and that would definitely be something of interest, especially if your deer are hanging out with your cattle, but also clostridium. And clostridium is a disease that one of the, one of the specific uh, species of clostridium causes botulism. And so clostridium is something that we vaccinate cattle against. But again, if we have deer that have clostridium and they're actually grazing in the same vicinity as cattle, that would be something that would be nice to know because you would want to make sure that your cattle inoculations are up to date and that everything, uh, the cattle are protected. Next slide, please. And so here I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kalu so that he can talk about some of our results and uh, with the different counties. And you will see on this first slide, these are the counties that were represented in the 2021 uh, deer season for our collection purposes. So Dr. Kalu, take it away. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, the next few slides will be talking about um, the blood smears and what we actually found out in different counties in Georgia. So the this presentation here, as you can see, we noticed that in Burke County had the highest rate of anaplasmosis followed by Tabo Carry, then Mayweather, Marion, and also Jefferson. So this kind of had the highest amount of anaplasmosis when we did the blood smear from um, the wild till there. Next slide, please. So um, this other slide shows the relate the rate of anaplasmosis and sickle cell in white tail deer. Now, if you look at for Burke County, as we said in the previous slide, had the highest amount of anaplasmosis. Then for the sickle red blood cell, Burke County also had the highest amount of sickle red blood cell. But Tabor County wasn't as much as Burke County, which was followed by Meriwether, Upson too. So those three counties only had the presence of sickle red blood cell. Next slide, please. Just as Dr. Samples talked about the gram positive pass line, which was an incidental finding, we noticed that in Tabo County, it had the high, very high amount of gram positive pass line, followed by Crawford, Marion, and Upson County. 
So for the gram positive bacilli, which hasn't been identified yet, we, during the next quarter hunt season, every blood sample we collect from these carries will be sent to the Tifting Diagnosis Lab for further identification. Next slide, please. So the blood smear that we actually um, did, we noticed anaplasmosis in the white tail blood. If you look at this blood smear and kind of look to around three o'clock, you would notice ring forms of anaplasmosis, the gram negative intracellular bacterium is actually found on the periphery of the red blood cell. So if you look at three, around three o'clock, you would see a kind of purple dot on every red blood cell. That is the gram negative bacterium. The anaplasmos is a gram negative intracellular bacterium, which actually invades red blood cell, giving it a kind of ring shape infestation. Next slide, please. Okay, now this is another slide that shows a, a gram positive bacilli, um, also shows sickle red blood cell, show, also shows the anaplasmosis infestation, schistocyte, which are called fragmented red blood cell, and dacrocyte, which is also called teardrop red blood cell. This form of this blood, this blood slide actually shows that the anaplasmosis has actually been causing a lot of hemolysis in the white tail, white tail deer blood. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, the A of this diagram shows the sickle red blood cell. B, which has been identified here, is actually the anaplasmosis. If you look at the, the red blood cell, you will see um, a kind of purple dot around the periphery of the red blood cell, and which you would know that this white there has actually been infected by anaplasmosis. The gram-positive bacilli, which is C, was actually identified and, as I said before, was an incidental finding. Next slide, please. So this gives you a good picture of what we actually found when we did the blood smear. And as I said before, we actually found in some counties. So it had a lot of um, gram-positive bacilli, but when you look at the the animal, the white tail deer, most of the white tail deer didn't show any significant pathology in sense, in sense of the, the, the general appearance or the organs being damaged. So during the next quarter hunt season, we will take the blood sample for investigation and try to find out what is this gram positive bacilli. Next slide, please. So the gram-positive bacilli was identified in Tabor County, in Crawford, Marion, Meriwether, Taylor, and Bibb County. The Tabor County had the highest amount of deer exhibiting gram-positive bacilli. And as we reiterated before, the blood sample will be sent to the Tifton County to identify what exactly is this gram-positive bacilli. Next slide, please. So why anaplasmosis? What is the public health significance? And why the white tail deer? Now, the reason why we are so particular about this anaplasmosis is it's an obligate gram-negative intracellular bacteria. It acts, the white tail deer acts as a reservoir and that is a point of the zoonotic transmission. Now, anaplasmosis is not, could cause zoonotic infestation 
whereby it could be transmitted from to interspecies, also from the white-tailed deer to humans. And the intermediary vector is the exodus scapularis, which actually could bite the white-tailed deer, and if found on the human, could also transmit this intracellular bacterium through the tick. Next slide, please. Now, when the individual has been infected by this intracellular bacterium, after its incubation period, this individual presents with acute symptoms. Now, the CDC has said that this infestation is somehow difficult to diagnose without proper history and investigation. So if you look at the symptoms, it generally has same presentation with other infestation, just like flu, because the individual could present with fever, chills, severe headache, muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and loss of appetite. Without a proper history about, number one, the prevalence of anaplasmosis in the state or in the country, or what the the what the individual did, maybe do maybe let's say for instance deer hunting, getting a specific diagnosis for anaplasmosis infestation becomes very difficult. Next slide, please. So if the individual is not treated properly, that individual goes to the chronic symptoms where it leads to respiratory failure, blood problems, and organ failure. The reason why is this, this gram-negative intracellular bacterium causes hemolysis of the red blood cell. After causing hemolysis of the red blood cell, also cause the complete blood count will show decreased platelet counts and decreased red blood cell counts. And when there's decreased platelet counts, it could lead to breathing problem respiratory failure, and organ failure. When it comes to the death of the individual, it depends on a lot of factors. Number one is the individual immunocompromised. If the individual is immunocompromised, that could lead to the death of the individual. Now, if the also individual taking chemotherapy agents, it could also cause immunosuppression of the body, which could lead to death. The elderly too, people with weak immune system could also be um, have a fatal consequence with the infestation of the anaplasmosis. But for immunocompetent individual, they all, all come down with severe illness of this disease. Now, the only way with, with a good history and proper examination the, it will help the medical practitioner to be able to perform diagnostic tests like immunofluorescence antibodies, which should be able to diagnose that, okay, this individual has been infected with anaplasmosis. Next slide, please. Now, the reason why this anaplasmosis is important is that Georgia has not been implicated in the state which has prevalence of anaplasmosis. 90% of the reported cases of anaplasmosis in 2020 were found in eight states, which are Vermont, Maine, Rhode Island, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, and New York. So Georgia was never implicated. So the, the findings we got from this DEAR project actually would help public health, the public health department and also medical practitioners, especially when the when they're treating individuals from those counties that we found the presence of this gram negative bacteria. So anaplasmosis has been identified in white tail deer in Georgia. Next slide, please. So now what are the public health preventive strategies? Number one, the use of incenticides to actually take care 
of the tick. Now, any wild game that appears ill or is displaying any abnormal behavior should not be eaten. For the people on the doing the the actually the wild the game hunters should actually wear protective gloves and apparel so to protect themselves from being bitten by the exotic tick. They should not eat or drink while preparing game carcasses and skin hides should be processed outside and free of parasites before attempting to taint or process. Next slide, please. Now, any abnormalities that are found in this wild tidia should be discarded. I could remember during the research project, once we found some, some of the organs like the liver had with a hard inconsistency. And when we took the, the liver for investigations, we actually found that, that this liver had what we call viral hepatitis. So the good thing was that because of our presence and the knowledge which we had about the, the most of the organs, it actually helped most of the hunters to discard some of the organs that we found that were not good. So if during the processing of this wild today and we you, the individual notice that the organs are damaged, it is important to dispose either the organs or the entire carcasses. Now it's also important to minimize brain and spinous tissue contact because sometimes the, for, like for the brain, it could have um, a kind of viral bacterial infestation, which could probably be transmittable. So it's also important to minimize contact. It's also, it's also important not to feed contaminated meat to other infestation or to other animals and also companion animals, because that could also be a mode of transmission. And it's important to emphasize hand washing with soap and water or alcohol-based sanitizers after wild game. Next slide, please. So after killing of the wild-tailed deer, the, it's important to wash the tools, the equipment, and also the walking surfaces by adding a little bit of bleach to a gallon of water and wash all the equipment and allow to air dry and store properly to avoid rust and contamination. Next slide, please. So as I said before, while we were working with the, well, the processing their plant, we noticed a lot of um, viral and some other um, abnormal organs that were not meant to be eaten. So, it's also important to avoid eating raw or undercooked meat, especially with the wild tail deer. And any uncooked game should be properly frozen, refrigerated, or disposed properly. Now, all carcasses should be transported to a processing cooler to avoid spoilage of the meat. Next slide, please. So thank you, and I'm ready for any questions you might want to ask. Here we go. Um, thank you both very much for the presentation. I do have one uh, question that, that came up as you were talking. Um, what would you say is the, the primary risk to humans that are consuming uh, wild game in, in terms of, you know, any kind of biological risk that could be transferred through consumption of meat that's undercooked? Yeah. I I'll take first stab at this, but I would say, you know, much like any meat that we eat, uh, undercooked meat rare is just, it may have been a thing and a trend years ago, but it's really not a healthy trend now. Uh, I would not, especially with uh, wild game, I would not consume anything that was not cooked to at least 
uh, you know, medium to well done. Uh, it, in fact, this was one of mine and Dr. Kalu's entertainments while we were sitting there waiting to do our collections as uh, animals were being processed that we would occasionally look at something and say, I wouldn't eat that and I don't care how well done you cooked it. It just does not look healthy. Because one of the things, and this was not mentioned in our presentation, but one of the things that we saw quite a bit of was tumors on animals, both organs as well as on the outside, you know, on, on the actual skin of the animal. And I'm just really sorry, but you just can't convince me that that's something you should be eating if it has things growing off of it. it you know, that's just not, you would look at it. And of course, the people are paying good money to have these animals processed. And we would just shake our heads like, there is no way that you could convince me that is healthy to eat. But, you know, you have to, I, I think that it's, um, you know, this is probably one of the biggest things with any type of meat, but especially when it's being self-processed or, or processed outside of, because of course, even though your processing houses, your deer processing places, you know, they are inspected to a degree, but they're not inspected as in a USDA stamp on it when it goes out the door to your freezer. So that would be my biggest thing. And then the, the second biggest thing would be the parasites. Because unfortunately, even in the winter, you know, the fall and the winter in Georgia, many times the parasites just don't die because it just does not get cold enough here. And so they're always around. So Dr. Kalu, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, just as the samples have said, well, during the, while during the quarter hunt, while we were there, we noticed some of these organs where they brought them out from the wild to there, some of them were actually abnormal. We saw some tumors. We actually saw a liver, as I said before, had this viral hepatitis in them. And we had a discussion with the game hunters and say, hey, look, you see, for these organs, I would suggest not to eat them because this, based on this consistency, this could actually be diseased. And when we notice any of the um, while today that was actually had a kind of also we saw sort of like an also they look malignant in a way we actually spoke to those while today now if you look at the slide which i just showed previously you would notice like gram positive bacilli you could see the um the anap the intracellular bacterium the because if you notice too some of those red blood cells were actually damaged now take for instance the individual did not cook this meat and probably eat this meat. That could also be another form of transmission to the um, to the individual. Now, if the companion animal, like the, the dog, actually eats this animal that had high infestation, let's say for bull carry that had the anaplasmosis, the gram positive bacilli, which we have not identified yet, what that bacteria that bacilli might be. It could be anything then the dog or whoever eats the, that particular meat that is, un, that is undercooked, that could be a, another mode of transmission. So we had a good discussion with the, the game hunters and say, hey, look, this is what we feel, this is what we should do. We also had the discussion with the processing plant and we told them that, okay, based on this consistency of, of this organ, we advise you tell the game hunter that, hey, look, we know you killed it, we know you want to hang it in front of your house and all that, but please, we advise you to take off these organs and process this meat. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Samples and Dr. Kalu, very much for being our presenters today. Uh, your work is very important, very interesting. And you know we're we're glad to have you here today, and glad to have everyone else here for the environmental health session with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a wonderful conference, and uh, just stay safe out there. Yes, you as well. Thank you.